We are in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 14 to be exact this morning. Hope you've been enjoying the journey. I know I have. I'm thankful for all the many lessons that we learn as we go through expositionally. Some of you may be new to our church or you've just been coming a while. I Every week I meet new people and some in the first service and they're just like, wow, this is fantastic. I've never been taught the Bible verse by verse. It's what we call expositional teaching. And we're just going verse by verse, just taking every nugget that's here. And as we do that, there are lessons to be drawn out. And one of the greatest of which today is going to be that of being a servant. So let's pray. Lord, we pray that we would be servants. You said if he wants to be great in the kingdom of God, let him be a servant. And Lord, as we see Paul and Barnabas here on their first missionary endeavor, that's what we see. True, two real servants, Lord. And as we look at their life, we're able to pull out qualities qualities that we want in our lives, that you want in our life. So we pray that, Holy Spirit, you would be that great truth teacher once again this morning as we open up your word, and we pray this in Jesus' name, we all say amen. So again, we've entitled our series Momentum because we see the momentum of the early church as they're constantly shifting through the gears. I mean, picking up momentum. And here we are now where the church has gone to the Gentile world and it's now launching from there throughout Asia Minor, will eventually go all throughout Europe. So this is exciting. Now, this morning, as well as next Sunday, we're going to be looking, as I mentioned, of what it means to be a servant, the qualities that make for effective service. It's been said that the world measures a man's greatness by the number of people who serve him, but God measures a man's greatness by the number of people he serves. Again, if we're going to be great in God's kingdom, we must be servants, so what does that look like? And what are the qualities that God is looking for? Well, in this chapter, we find seven qualities that really leak out of the passage that show us what a servant really looks like. So I've entitled our message this morning, Qualities of an Effective Servant. And this morning, we're just going to look at the first three in the first 18 verses. Next week, we'll look at the following four. Now, they're there in your outline for you where we're going. We're going to see that an effective servant serves in boldness, serves in the power of the Holy Spirit, and serves in humility. Now, again, as we come to this chapter, Paul and Barnabas are on their first missionary journey, and they've arrived at the city of Iconium. And what brought them here? Well, at the end of chapter 13, the last city they were in, <clears throat> they ejected them out of their city said, we don't want you here anymore. And uh, many times, Paul didn't have to second guess if, if God is wanting him to go on to the next city. It was pretty clear. Sometimes they were trying to stone him to death. We'll see that today. Uh, or they expel him out of the city. So here they are now moving into the next city, which is Iconium. And understand, as we're going to be looking at this passage today, Paul doesn't stand up and give a seven-point sermon on the qualities of a servant. Rather, what we see is these qualities come out of his life as we see Paul and Barnabas serving the Lord. And that really serves as an even greater example. Now, the first thing we're going to see here is that a servant of God serves with boldness. And let me say right off the bat, this is something we've seen before, uh, that the early church would move in boldness. But to me, that only serves to emphasize how important this is in our own lives. God is calling us, especially in these last days, to be courageous. So now what happened in Iconium, this is now skirting along the coast in ancient Asia Minor. Today, that's modern-day Turkey. That we went together to the synagogue of the Jews. Now, we've mentioned this before. This was Paul's M.O. every time he came to a city. Paul was a rabbi. He was a former a Pharisee now converted to Christianity. But he would be able to then go to a synagogue, being a Jew, and have a platform. Whenever uh, a visiting rabbi visited, the local rabbi would give them an opportunity to expound the scriptures. And Paul would take advantage of that opportunity, of course, and preach Christ from the Old Testament. Now, notice it tells us here that he so spoke 
that a great multitude of both Jews and of the Greeks believe. Now, really what I want you to see here, what led to their salvation was that he so spoke. There is speaking and there is so speaking. So speaking is speaking in the power of the Holy Spirit. You try to generate something in your flesh or on your own authority. Well, I've learned this and I've got this. It, it falls flat. But when you use God's word and you so speak in the power of God, wow, what an effect it makes. When we are preaching, certainly in our church, we're not called to preach some kind of a mamby-pamby, watered down, let's try and trick people into the kingdom kind of gospel. We, that kind of preaching just tickles men's ears and it has no lasting effect. We need to so speak the gospel that it has an eternal effect. And I've told you before, it's when I'm teaching God's word and when you're sharing God's word. It does two things. It comforts the afflicted, because that's God's word. It's what it does. But it also afflicts the comforted, right? Ooh, I didn't like that, you see. So <clears throat> when we preach the full gospel, which that means is we preach repentance from sin and faith in Jesus Christ alone. We're not preaching a feel-good message that basically says this. Hey, Jesus loves you and he wants to save you. Well, that's true. Jesus loves you and he wants to, that, that's true. But in order to experience that, you need to repent of your sin. You need to turn from your former lifestyle and now follow Jesus Christ. If that's not presented, that's not the full gospel. And the fruit of that is seen in the people of, who say, well, I gave my life to Jesus 20 years ago, but they're not walking with Jesus they don't read their Bible. They don't pray. They don't go to church. Why? Well, they weren't saved. When we preach the gospel, we want to so speak and preach that we present the full gospel. That's what Paul did, and lives were changed. Now, we read here, though, in verse 2, that unbelieving Jews, those that didn't believe, stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brethren. So <clears throat> some of the Jews that didn't accept got a little upset about this. We've seen this before. So what did Paul and Barnabas do? Hey, man, let's get out of here. No, verse 3. Therefore, they stayed there a long time. <laughs> Isn't that courageous, right? And speaking boldly in the Lord, who was bearing witness the word of his grace, granting even signs and wonders to be done through their hands. So here, God was allowing them to do certain miracles and so forth. And we'll see this along Paul's journeys along the way. In fact, we'll see this in one case uh, in our passage today. What I really want to key on here, though, is that they stayed here a good amount of time. Would have been, have been easier to leave. And they spoke boldly the word of grace. These men were fearless. These men were courageous. And by the way, this was a way of life for Paul. Later on, when he's writing to the Thessalonians about his journey through Philippi, he says this in 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 2. Even when we suffered and were shamefully entreated in Philippi, we were bold in God to speak the gospel. That didn't stop us, you see. Paul came to expect opposition. Hey, when he came into a city, he was looking at the local prison, not the local inn, because that's probably where he'd be spending the night. And when Paul came into town, there was either a revival or a riot, sometimes both. By the way, we see this mentality of boldness beginning with the disciples, right? We remember back in chapter 2, the church's birth. And here's Peter and John, and they're going to the temple. They're so excited. Christianity is beginning to blossom there in Jerusalem. And they see this man that's, you know, been... Uh, has been lame from for ages. And, you know, Peter says, silver and gold I don't have, but what I do have, in the name of Jesus, I'm going to give it to you. Stand up and walk. And he walks and he's healed. And, and he's arrested. Him and Peter are arrested. And, and they're told, hey, John, Peter, we don't want you preaching the gospel. In Acts 4, 19, they said, look, whether it's right in the sight of God to listen to you more than God, uh, you judge. But for us, we cannot speak the things we have seen and heard. In other words, we're not going to stop. In fact, they left that meeting. They went back and they told the rest of the church, you're not going to believe this. We were arrested for our faith. Really? And you know what everybody said? We want to be bold like that. And so in Acts 4.29, they said, Lord, they began to pray. Look at their threats. 
And grant to us, your servants, boldness that we can speak your word. And it says the place they were gathered was shaken. They were filled with the Holy Spirit and they spoke with boldness. And so instead of retreating, Lord, get us out of here. They prayed, they said, Lord, give us boldness. And that's exactly what Paul and Barnabas had here. Now, what happens in verse four, though, is that the multitude of the city was divided, part sided with the Jews, part with the apostles. So they're preaching the gospel, and guess what the gospel does? The gospel divides. I, I mentioned in our last study, you name the name of Jesus, you just divided the room, my friends. Half over here, half over there, that's it. Jesus said, you're either for me or against me. Jesus said, I came to bring a sword. I came to bring truth. And when people hear the truth, some just don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear that. And it separates, it divides. So some in the city wanted to follow Paul and Barnabas, others did not. And when a violent attempt in verse five was made, both the Gentiles and the Jews with rulers, they abuse, to abuse and stone them. So this now gets this hostile group collaborates together. Let's murder Paul and Barnabas. Let's take him outside of the city and stone him. But they came aware of it and they fled to Lystra and Derby, cities of Lyconia and to the surrounding region. Now, Paul and Barnabas were bold, but they weren't stupid, right? They go to the next city. You say, I, I, I thought God wants us to be bold. He does. But he wants bold living servants, <laughs> not dead ones. So there were times where it was obvious that they move on to the next city. Jesus taught this. In Matthew 10, 23, he said, when they persecute you in this city, then you flee to another and that's what Paul and Barnabas were doing. But notice what they're doing. They go to the next city. What do they do in verse 7? And they were preaching the gospel there. They were faithful. So notice something interesting to note here, though, is they come to the region of Lyconia. Um, they didn't preach in a synagogue. That tells us there wasn't one. It would take 10 Jewish men to establish a synagogue. And if you came to a, a town that didn't have a synagogue, that tells you you didn't have any, even at least 10 Jewish men. So that tells us now, Paul and Barnabas, as they're going further and further in their journey, they're now in true Gentile territory. But the first thing we see here is that an effective servant is one that is bold. So are you willing to stand up for your faith? Stand up for your faith to your family. Sometimes that's not easy, easy just in your family to your friends, your coworkers. The day and age in which we live calls for it, I'll be honest with you. We're being called today to take sides. So is Jesus Lord of all or is he just a God of convenience to you? Because if you don't have a close relationship with him, then you're gonna, you're gonna fall like Peter did and deny the Lord. And we don't wanna do that. So we need to pray for boldness, amen? We need to pray for that in these last days. That's what will make us effective servants, boldness. Now, the second thing we see is that an effective servant serves in the power of the Holy Spirit. Certainly, we see this with Paul all the time. And in Lystra, a certain man without strength in his feet was sitting, a cripple from his mother's womb who had never walked. So here's a man disabled from birth, never walked, and this man heard Paul speaking. Now, because Paul is not speaking in the synagogue, most likely he's speaking in the Agora. All Roman towns were marked out, every single one. When we go to ruins, it doesn't matter where you go throughout all Europe, Middle East, they're all laid out the exact same. Every Roman city is the same. And the Gura, which is the marketplace, is in the same place, as well as a Greek city. And Paul would come to the Greek city and the city in the Gura. And by the way, there was usually a place where speakers would be able to talk. So this is where Paul is. He's sharing his faith in the Agura and Paul observing this man intently. So obviously the man was close enough where Paul could see they could lock eyes. And Paul observing him intently and seeing that he had faith to be healed. So evidently somewhere in his message, he's received Christ. I want that. And Paul can even say that this man, I'm gonna heal this man. The Holy Spirit obviously had to speak to his heart in regard to that. And so Paul said with a loud voice, verse 10, stand up straight on your feet. And he leaped and walked. He was healed immediately. I love the fact that he actually leaped before he walked. Just boing, 
you know, he just jumped up. I would too, right? I mean, can you imagine? But Paul obviously did this in the Holy Spirit. Just as Peter took hold of that man who had never walked before in the temple area and said, what I say to you, stand to your feet, you better know it's the Holy Spirit. And Paul knew it was the Holy Spirit to say this to this man. Now, let me ask you, I mean, he's walking in his giftedness. He obviously had the gift of healing. That's one of many gifts. But first of all, do we not all have the Holy Spirit? The answer is yes. You can't be born again without the Holy Spirit. Does the Holy Spirit provide power for every believer? Absolutely. Does God give all believers a gift or gifts, plural? The answer is yes. Do all Christians know what their giftedness is? No. Yeah, you got that right. If I was asked for a show of hands, how many know where your gift is? It'd probably be about half. But listen, Every Christian, we're all gifted. There are many passages. Let me give, give you one. 1 Corinthians 12, 7. The manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one, every believer, for the profit of all. And there are many lists of the gifts. By the way, we, we know that Paul had many other gifts. I mean, Paul had the gift of preaching, Paul had the gift of teaching. These are gifts mentioned in the New Testament. Paul had the gift of exhortation. Paul had the gift of administration. I believe, by the way, all four of those gifts are gifts that senior pastors must possess. But here's what I want you to see. As Paul stepped out to serve the Lord, he did so in the power of the Holy Spirit and in that area that he was gifted. And God has gifted all of us, and he wants to step out and serve him in the area that he has gifted us. But just as we said, you know, most of us don't know where we're gifted, right? So how can we know? Well, first of all, let me say this. Um, I did a whole series called Gifted um, from 1 Corinthians chapter 12. You can go online. You can go on our app. It's free. It's there. Download a message, a message is to help you in walking in your giftedness. But one of the best things to do is, at least my analogy is this. It's like being on a baseball team. Let's imagine you're a coach and you're given, you know, a bunch of eight-year-olds and you got to coach these guys. Well, you don't even know what position they play or how they play. So the best thing to do is get them all in the field. You go to, you go to outfield, you go to second base, go to third base, you pitch, you catch, and you start playing around with them. You start saying, that guy can't pitch worth beans. He's... Okay, we're going to put you over here, you know, and, and then you have someone in the outfield, that, you know, you're not too good. Let's see if you can catch behind the plate. Oh, yeah, you can catch, you know. And it's as they are in the game, as they are playing, they're able to find their way of where they are most gifted. Now, here's the point. You will never know what your giftedness is if you're warming the bench, if all you're doing is sitting and you're not even serving, God's not going to pull up and, oh, I know what my gift is. And all of a sudden, you have to step into the game. So the, one of the best things to do is just start serving. Just step up to the plate and start serving somewhere. You say, well, pastor, I'm not sure where to serve. Just come see me afterwards. I can point you in the right direction like no one's business. Go to the connection booth. Just, there's lots of areas that you can serve. And now you might serve in that area and go, you know, this is really not for me. I'm not clicking here. Great. Find another area. God, but see, because you're serving, which we're all, by the way, called to be servants, because you're serving, God will begin to move you in your area of giftedness. And here's what happens when you find your area of giftedness. You're blessed by it, and others are blessed by it. That's really, really one of the key areas of knowing that's your giftedness. Now, let's say you think you have the gift of teaching, but you're teaching and no one wants to listen to what you have to say. That's probably not your gift. You understand? You get the idea. Or you're in children's church. I hate working with kids. This is driving me crazy. Well, you shouldn't have had eight of your own then. What were you doing when you did it? I'm just kidding. But the first thing you want to do is, is, is serve. In 1 Peter 4, 10, it says, Every man has received a gift. Even so, minister it one to another as good stewards. We're all called to be good stewards. We've been gifted, and we use that stewardship. So use it. By the way, in that next verse, it also says, Let us do it with the ability that God gives. And that ability comes from the Holy Spirit. 
We're told in Ephesians 6, 10, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. You can't do things on your own. You can't even serve the Lord in your own strength. It'll be disastrous. So this is what we see with Paul. You say, well, I did this miracle. Yeah, well, that was an area he was gifted in and called in. That's probably, that's probably not your gift. But whatever your gifting is, you, you want to do it for Jesus. You want to know what that is. And uh, again, that series, I talk about many, many other things. But if we're to be effective servants, one is we need to be bold. We need to be bold. And secondly, we need to serve in the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, there's a third thing, and that means humility. Humility. And I love the way the Holy Spirit put these in order. If we want to make an impact, we must do so with humility because it, we could be bold and we can serve in our giftedness, but if we lack humility, then it doesn't have much effect at all. And so we must serve in that humbleness, that humility. The humility is the channel that God uses. In fact, someone said this, he who has other graces without humility is like one who carries a bowl of precious powder without a cover on a windy day. You get the picture, right? Humility keeps the lid on our usefulness. It really does keep the lid on our usefulness. Because if we get so proud in our giftedness or what God's doing through us, God can't use us. Peter, as he's closing his letter in 1 Peter, he says in chapter 5 and verse 5, let all of us be clothed with humility. We should, that literally means wrapped up in humility. It should be a, a top character in our lives. Why? Because God resists the proud, but he gives his grace to the humble. God is looking for humility. By the way, humility is not thinking lowly of yourself. You know, humility is not, oh, I'm a nobody. Oh, no, I'm a loser. That, no, that's not humility. Humility is not thinking of yourself at all. And this is something we all fight. You say, I don't fight with pride. That's a pretty proud statement, just that alone, isn't it? But Think about it this way. When anybody takes a group picture, let's say you're part of a group picture. Maybe it's a life group. It's a family gathering and stuff. And, and they all, hey, let me see that picture. Who's the first person you look for? Yourself. You know, that's the truth. You're not looking at the, oh, Uncle Bob, you look so great there. And Auntie Emma, oh, they, you look so, you're not doing that. You're looking at yourself. Hey, can we retake that picture? I don't look good in that one, yeah. You say, I don't do that. I hate myself. I, I've met people, I can't stand myself. I hate myself, really? If any of you here hated yourself, you know what? You'd look like a wreck today. Your hair would not have been brushed for a month. You'd be wearing clothes that have holes that it look terrible. You would smell because you don't take, because you don't care about yourself. You hate yourself. But you know what? None of you are like that. I look at you all look great. You all looked in the mirror this morning. Why did you do that? Because you love yourself. I mean, we, we do, we love ourselves. In fact, the Bible tells us that. Ephesians 5, 29, no one ever hated his own flesh. When I meet someone that says, no, I don't want to hate myself, well, you're the only person in the history of the world because the Bible says no man ever hated his own flesh. And you see, but we buy into the lie that the world says, well, you got to first learn how to love yourself. In fact, we even know that passage of scripture. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. See, there it is. No, that's not what that passage is saying. That Bible, that Bible passage is saying, love your neighbor as you already love yourself. We love ourselves. Okay, I don't want to go on a whole thing on that because it's dangerous. Proverbs 16, 18 says, pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. So let's look at the rest of this text and see how Paul and Barnabas were victorious over the temptation towards pride. So notice verse 11. Now, when the people saw that what Paul had done, you know, he had healed that man, they raised their voices. They began shouting, saying in the Lyconian language, the gods have come down to us in the likeness of men. So this fevered pitch, these, these men are gods. Now, why would they say that? Well, Believe it or not, Lyconia was part of Greek mythology. 
It said that the gods Zeus and Hermes at one time came down and visited the city of Lystra, disguised as mortal men seeking food and lodging. However, they inquired at a thousand homes and they were turned down. So as the myth goes on, an elderly couple, their names were Philemon and his wife, Basias, they lodged him and gave them a meal from their meager sources. In appreciation for what they did, the gods transformed their home into a temple, then proceeded to wipe out and kill all the inhabitants of the city and make Philemon and Basias the guardians of the temple. How was that? Turned them into two oaks of pillar, you know, pillar oaks. So now I'm thinking, what kind, with friends like that, gods like that, who needs enemies, right? Well, that's, that's Greek mythology, of course. But this is what these people are believing. They're thinking, wait a second. Uh, the gods have given us a second chance. Here's Zeus and here's Hermes. They've come back. We're not going to mess it up this time. And Barnabas, verse 12, they called Zeus, and Paul they called Hermes because he was the chief speaker. How about that? So here you have, by the way, some of your translations may actually say uh, Barnabas is called Jupiter and Paul is called Mercury. Those are the Roman equivalents. So, you know, the Romans would just take the gods from the Greeks who took gods from the other. It all goes all the way back to the Tower of Babel. Back to all, the, just the, all this idolatry. But here they are worshiping, you know, this, this mythology. And Zeus to them was considered, of course, the supreme deity. And uh, Hermes was regarded as the god of eloquence. Now, the very fact that Barnabas is named Zeus probably tells us he had a more uh, imposing appearance. Uh, we know that Paul didn't because history gives us a little composite sketch of Paul, that he was small, bald-headed, he had bangly knees, bulging eyes, and a large nose. So he wasn't going to grace the cover of GQ. But he was the key speaker, so he was called Hermes. So here are Paul and Barnabas. All they're doing is preaching the gospel with boldness. They heal this guy, you know. But all of a sudden, these people come to worship them. Now think about this, it would have been, what a, what a temptation for Paul and Barnabas. It would have been really easy for them to rationalize and take advantage of this situation. Hey, let's go along with it, you know. I mean, after all, we've had a long journey. It'd be kind of nice to be pampered. And while we're having massages and having our feet rubbed, we could talk to, the, talk to them about the gospel, you know. Right? I mean, there, there could have been that reasoning going on. A subtle temptation but Paul and Barnabas would have nothing to do with it. Listen, you don't have to, you know, to be a somebody in their eyes like a God. We don't have to be a somebody to share the gospel. Anybody can share the gospel. We don't need to take advantage of situations, only the ones that are of God, right? Because listen, there's a true story that is similar to this, and it's, uh, it's from James uh, Cook. Remember the guy that discovered the Hawaiian Islands? They were called the Cook Islands and the Sandwich Islands and then Hawaiian Islands. Well, true story. This is how Captain James Cook died, by the way. When Captain James Cook discovered the Hawaiian Islands first dropped anchor in Hanama Bay, he was greeted with a great ceremony, realizing that the islanders thought he was their god, Lono. Cook thought, all right, take advantage of it, right? Consequently, he and his men were treated to everything the islanders had to offer until one evening when Cook was about to take advantage of yet another woman, he was clubbed in the back of the head by her husband, who in anger forgot that Captain Cook was Lono. Bleeding and groaning, the captain went down. By the time he came to, he found himself looking into the eyes of his aggressor who said, the gods don't bleed, and they don't groan, and Cook was killed on the spot. Whew, not a way to go. But that's how Satan works. He lures us with pride. So Paul and Barnabas, this is the lure of pride, being hailed as gods. By the way, there's an interesting uh, change from the beginning of the chapter. In the beginning of the chapter, the people wanted to kill Paul and Barnabas. In Lystra, they want to worship Paul and Barnabas. Isn't that interesting? But Satan will throw all kinds of different darts. One of them he throws at is persecution. 
right? Like the early chapter, persecution. He tries to get us to give up. It worked in chapter 13 with John Mark. Hey, I'm out of here. I, I, this is too much. I didn't sign up for this. And he took off. That didn't work for Paul and Barnabas. They keep pressing on. But now they're tempted with pride. Another man was tempted with pride. His name was Samson. He, he thought he had all power and he can handle any situation. He can handle the women and everything until he got a hold of one Delilah who deceived him and he went down. He had his eyes put out. He, he ended not so well. I love what the Scottish preacher Robert Murray McShane said in regard to pride. He said, oh, for true unfeigned humility. I know I have cause to be humble, yet I don't know the half of that cause. And I know I am proud, and I know I don't know half of my pride, end quote. There's an honest preacher, right? So we all need to be on our guard. Now let's pick it up in verse 13. Then the priests of Zeus. So here there's a whole temple there to Zeus. He comes out of the temple in front of the city and he brings oxen and garland to the gates intending to sacrifice with the multitudes. So now gonna offer up sacrifices to Paul and Barnabas. And when the apostle, apostles Barnabas and Paul heard this, they tore their clothes. They ran in among the multitude crying saying, men, why are you doing these things? This is wrong. We're, we're here to worship and point you to Christ, not ourselves, right? So they try to stop them, and, and they honestly say, we are men of the same nature as you. We're flesh and bones. bones. We're, not, we're not gods. We're sinners saved by grace. And we've come, verse 15, to preach to you that men should turn from these vain things, this idol is a vain thing. It's empty. A vain thing means it's empty. This is empty. This, these idols that you worship are the, the figment of men's imaginations. And they can't save you. And we all see that in our culture. You know, the this wood, the stone, the metal gods. How foolish. But again, we are tempted with different idols. Homes, cars, possessions, right? You name it. It's all vanity. Paul says, we preach to you that you should turn from these vain things and turn to the who? The living God. Who's that? Who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all things that are in it? The God of creation. Who, in bygone generations, allowed all nations to walk in their ways? God, for a season, has allowed men. In fact, it tells us in Romans 1, 26, God has given up men. If that's the way you want to live, God has given them up to their own desires. And we see that in our society today. Nevertheless, he did not leave himself without a witness. God has never left man without an opportunity to turn from sin and turn to him. In that, he, in, in that he did good, he has given us rain from heaven, fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food and gladness. God has extended to man what we call his common grace. But again, above all, God has given us, as he talks about in verse 15, uh, he's made the heavens, the earth. He's given us creation that points to a designer. In fact, we're gonna be starting the book of Romans in about a month in our midweek service. And, and it tells us in Romans 20, 120, that since the beginning, creation, it cries out. Creation cries out that there is a designer so that men are without excuse. So Paul is just expressing the gospel to these men. And with these sayings, verse 18, they could scarcely restrain the multitudes from sacrificing to them. Now, the indication was they were able to, and they didn't sacrifice to them. And we'll see even in the following chapters that some of them come to Christ. But what, what a challenge. They were challenged. Would they allow this opportunity to raise them up pride, or would they be humble? And I would just simply say this. Humility is always the make it, break it factor. Show me a person who doesn't have that much talent, doesn't have that much charisma, but has humility, and God will use him. God uses, he truly does use the humble. On the other hand, you could have a person that has all the charisma, uh, charisma in the world, has lots of gifts, talents, and everything, but lacks humility. God can't use him. These are the qualities that make for an effective servant. Boldness, walking in the power of the Spirit, 
and walking in humility. Now, next week, we'll go on to look at the final four. But let me close with this. Webster's Dictionary defines a servant as follows. A person devoted to another. A person devoted to another. Who are you devoted to? Who's the supreme person you're devoted to? I, I trust it's Jesus Christ. If it's not, I would like to give you an opportunity today to give your heart to him. As I was walking this morning, I like to walk in the mornings and pray. I was reminding of, reminded of the tabernacle. If you've ever you know, looked at the design of the tabernacle where God was worshiped, it, it, it was completely pitch black on the inside. It only had one, they didn't have electricity back then, but there was a candle, um, what's called a menorah was inside of it. And it was the only thing that lit that entire darkness so that the priest could operate. But it was ultimately a reminder to them that God is the light of the world. Without him, men grope in darkness. We need him. And then Jesus said that very thing. He said, I am the light of the world. He who comes to me will no longer have to walk in darkness, but have the light of life. So listen, if you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, you're, you're walking in darkness. Now you could see things, but you know the darkness part of this world and you're just like groping for meaning. You're groping and hoping for significance in life. Well, that will come in Christ. Your fulfillment comes in Christ. That's who God designed you and created you to have a relationship with him. And that's where it begins. Life begins once you surrender to Jesus. In fact, the Bible says, if any man would be in Christ Jesus, old things pass away and everything becomes brand new. How'd you like to have a restart on life? That's where it begins in Christ. So in just a moment, I would like to give you an opportunity to ask Christ in your life and to do what I had shared earlier, to express the gospel, which is what? I'm a sinner. Christ died on the cross for my sins. He rose from the dead, and I want to give my life to him. If you would like to do that today, I want to give you that opportunity. Or if maybe you are a Christian, but you've drifted from the Lord. You know, it doesn't take a lot to drift from God. It really doesn't. Because if you're only off 1%, you just take that line from 1%, you just keep going further and further. You'd be surprised in how many months, how much further you are from God. Or in years, how much you've drifted from God. And it's ever so slightly. And it happens. I like to say life happens. I got busy. This happened. I was overdoing this thing. All good things, but good things will keep us from the right thing. And so if you've drifted, I want you to come back to Jesus today. I want to give you that opportunity as well. So will you bow with me in prayer?